He was born to the right kind of a family on the right side of town. His wealthy father owned his own business. Francis had it all. He was handsome. He was given a good education, and he had many friends. But as Francis matured and grew up, he started to think that there was something more to life than just living the good life. One day he was riding down the road on his horse when he encountered a leper. Francis reached into his bag, threw some gold coins toward the leper, and spurred his horse. He wanted to get away from this uncomfortable situation. Suddenly he realized as he was accelerating away from the leper that he had to stop and turn back. So he went back to the leper took all of his money from his bag, and gave it to the leper. Then Francis, shaking with revulsion from the sight and smells of the leper's hideous sores, embraced the leper. We know this Francis as St. Francis of Assisi. His story is the story of a man who walked away from wealth and power in order to serve his fellow men. Many centuries after Francis of Assisi lived and died, the English Christian writer G. K. Chesterton said of him, Francis ran away to God the way some boys run away to the circus. Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht. Welcome to CWR, Christianity Without the Religion. CWR believes that there's more to our relationship with God than religious deeds and requirements. We believe that a relationship with God is given to us by His grace, but we cannot receive His invitation unless we surrender the lives that we would rather live, doing it our way, living life the way we would choose to do so. Our surrender to God as we receive His grace involves, among other things, giving up religious customs and tradition we think will earn us a beneficial, positive, and favorable relationship with God. CWR believes that our relationship with God is what our lives are all about. And we believe our relationship with God is all about His incredible grace. We're going to take a look at the last portion of the 11th chapter of Hebrews today in our message titled, The World Was Not Worthy of them. Let's pray. Dear God, we've already spoken of St. Francis of Assisi, and as we continue to reflect on the life you lived in and through him, we think of the prayer and of the hymn based on that prayer that has been historically attributed to him. His prayer, the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, is our prayer today as we enter into this service, this sermon. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is error, truth. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is darkness, light. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and in pardoning 
that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read from verses 32 through verse 40. In our message today, titled, The World Was Not Worthy of Them. And what more shall I say as we conclude this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews? Some have called it the faith chapter. Others have talked about the individuals cataloged and enumerated in this chapter as the hall of spiritual fame. Verse 32 now of Hebrews chapter 11, and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Again, our keynote, verse verse 38. The world was not worthy of them, And then concluding with verses 1 and 2 of the chapter that immediately follows, chapter 11, chapter 12 of Hebrews, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and we've just heard their names, we've just heard their stories in brief, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first verse of the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews reminds us as Christians that we are encompassed with a great cloud of witnesses. That statement follows this long catalog we read of the sufferings and sacrifices of men and women who stood up for their faith. St. Francis of Assisi is one of the many who are part of our great cloud of witnesses since the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews. Francis was born into an elite minority, rich in this world's goods, while the vast majority of the world at that particular time was impoverished. He was born into a world of holy wars in the name of God, religious animosity and hatred, with Christians and Muslims killing each other in what was called the Crusades. You know, it sounds a lot like our world today, doesn't it? Francis felt called by God to turn his back on his wealth and privilege So he renounced both militarism and materialism in the name of Jesus, pursuing the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdoms of this world. The story of Francis is a story of Christ-centered commitment to faith. We today live in a time of extremism, where Islamic extremists blow up innocence, impose Islamic law called Sharia law, an attempt to conquer the world in the name of Muhammad. We also see extremists who, in the name of Jesus Christ, blow up abortion clinics and spew venom and hatred towards homosexuals and others whose lifestyles 
they disapprove of. Francis of Assisi was an extremist as well. He was an extremist for God's amazing grace. In a similar way, we often say that PTM and CWR are extremists against religious authoritarianism and totalitarianism and oppression. We are irreligious Christians. We insist on the biblical teaching of faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. Our passage in Hebrews gives us this long list of men and women of whom the world was not worthy. These are true revolutionaries for Christ, men and women who gave their all, who resisted the religious establishment and the religious status quo, who refused to bow down to the idols of materialism and militarism, and who refused to kill their human beings in the name of a government that believed that murder and killing was the answer. I've been reading about Vaclav Havel recently. Havel, born in 1936, died several years ago in 2011. Havel was the ninth and last president of Czechoslovakia and the first president of the Czech Republic, serving as its president from 1993 until 2003. Like St. Francis of Assisi, Vaclav Havel was born into a wealthy family. After the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, he then became a dissident. He joined the resistance against the Russian communists. He resisted the totalitarian rule of the communists. And because of that, Havel was thrown in prison a number of times. Finally, having been declared leader of those who wished for and dreamed for freedom in Czechoslovakia, he led his country to freedom, throwing off the tyranny of communism. In 1978, Vaclav Havel explained that even though communism is a brutal system of repression and intimidation, based on massive popular surrender to its rule of fear, it was overthrown in his country because the people finally stopped surrendering to the rule of fear. They finally stood up and said, enough. Finally, with Havel's leadership, along with so many others, the Czech people found the courage to stop being silent in the face of oppression, and slowly the monolithic totalitarian communist government started to crumble. Ordinary people, little people just started to refuse to participate in and follow communist deception and lies and orders and requirements. They found the courage to resist in their faith in God. Whatever the nature of oppression, whether it's militaristic or religious, political or materialistic, the power of the few authorities on the top who are doing the oppressing depends on the tacit submission and silence of the majority on the bottom. What does this have to do with our relationship with God and our commitment to Jesus as Christ followers? We must stand with all of these men and women of faith we find listed in Hebrews chapter 11 who absolutely and totally follow Jesus Christ, resisting the threats and intimidation of the kingdoms of this world in the main represented by its government, military, and religious powers. Because our faith is in Christ alone. Faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. As Christ followers, we do not accept the vengeful, unloving God that is presented to us by religion. We refuse to believe and follow the empty threats of fear religion that presumes to have God sentencing many to eternal torture in hell, where apparently, according to Christless religion, they are roasted like a pig on a spit, simply because they refuse to bow the knee to religious ceremonies, creeds, and customs. As Christ followers, we turn our backs on religious pills, potions, programs, and prescriptions. Of course, 
standing for faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone is not that easy. It's far easier to go along with the popular ideas of God as taught by religion today. For example, turn your television on and you'll see men and women who say they represent God telling you that you can have, if you follow them and their teachings, your best life now. These television preachers will tell you that God will solve your financial problems virtually immediately because that's what he promises to do. That is, according to their interpretation of the Bible, they will tell you that God will give you the abundant life right now. This intoxicating message, often called the health and wealth gospel, promises its followers fancy clothes, jewelry, big homes, fast cars, no illnesses or diseases, all of this in the name of God. The health and wealth gospel promises to reverse the life of St. Francis of Assisi and all those that we read about here in Hebrews chapter 11, of whom the world was not worthy. It reverses all of that because it promises that God wants to prosper us financially right now and give us, all of us, good health right now. And if you don't prosper financially, if you don't get rid of all those physical debts and problems, and for that matter, your illnesses, then you must be doing something wrong, according to the health and wealth gospel. You'll need to do more, give more money, pray harder. But it all amounts to working harder to serve the God of religion, who is far from Jesus Christ. We renounce that false gospel. You won't hear much, if anything, about picking up your cross and following Jesus Christ in his sufferings from these health and wealth television preachers. They're corrupting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're turning people away from Jesus. They are religious pied pipers who are enticing people into slavery. They're leading people off a religious cliff. They're leading people into guilt and shame, which their followers experience when they inevitably do not realize the fantasy world of health and wealth promised by the false messiahs of North American television in these early years of the 21st century. You see, authentic Christianity is not a means to get something. Jesus didn't come to this earth smiling a cheesy grin like an oily used car salesman promising everybody their best life now. Jesus promised, on the other hand, persecution and hardship for all who followed him. Jesus said that following him would certainly involve suffering. For after all, that was the life he lived and the death he experienced. He didn't come to this earth to be served, but rather he came to this earth to serve us. And he calls us to that same ministry, the same calling, a life of service to others in his name. We can read about it in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40, in that parable of the sheep and the goats. When Jesus says in verses 34 through 40, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous are going to answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and we invited you in? We can't remember that, or needing clothes and clothe you. When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? We can't recall doing any of that. And the king will reply, verse 40 of chapter 25 of the book of Matthew, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. What Jesus is describing in Matthew 25 is revolutionary Christianity. It's Christianity without the religion. After he was released from prison where he did time for his role in Watergate, a man named Charles Chuck Colson founded a ministry called Prison Fellowship. Charles Colson or Chuck Colson is now deceased, but during his life he was fond of telling a story about the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua. According to Colson, the National Guard of Nicaragua, the repressive ruling government the Sandinistas were trying to overthrow, captured one of the Sandinista generals. The National Guard subjected this Sandinista general to unspeakable tortures, and finally, 
They castrated him. They put this beaten, violated man in one of their barbaric and sadistic prisons and then imprisoned his wife as well and raped her. They did everything possible to dehumanize and destroy this revolutionary leader. The war continued, and eventually the Sandinistas, the revolutionaries, were victorious. When the Sandinistas won the War of Revolution, they emptied all the prisons of the revolutionary prisoners. One of those released was this physically broken general who had been treated so inhumanely, who had been degraded and humiliated. When he was released, he came face to face with the authority who had ordered him tortured, castrated, and imprisoned in this abominable hellhole of a prison. Their roles were now reversed, and the man who had been so brutalized could have easily taken his revenge. He looked his tormentor in the eye and said, I know you, and you know me. The now free general said to this man, You are the one who ordered the rape and torture of my wife. Then he said to the man who had subjected him and his wife to unspeakable brutality and atrocities, I want you to know that this revolution has been about forgiveness. And I want you to know that I forgive you. The late Chuck Colson was fond of ending this story with the observation that this Sandinista general was not a Christian, but he embodied and illustrated forgiveness, one of the basic foundational elements of Christianity, in a way that many nominal Christians never do. In our message today, the one verse we focused on more than any other is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Who are these people this verse has in mind, of whom the world was not worthy? This verse is speaking of men and women who yielded to the risen Lord, who might live in them and enable them to be world changers revolutionary world changers making a real and lasting difference for the kingdom of God. Who are these world changers? They are Christ followers who were and are today revolutionaries. Many of you are extremists in that they believe and proclaim the radical, world-changing grace of God. God's calling you and me to be world changers. World changers are men and women who are now dead in Christ, who sacrificed their lives to serve others, and they are men and women who are now alive physically, of course, but more than that, alive spiritually in Christ. They reject the easy road. They reject the cultural and religious status quo, and they reject the idea that getting more and more stuff is the chief goal of life. God is calling you and me to be world changers, world changers, people that Hebrews chapter 11 verse 38 says the world was not worthy of them. People who reach out to others, sacrificing that others might know of the incredible grace of God, even if that sacrifice means that their life was not only uncomfortable, but their life might be threatened or shortened because of their commitment to the real, authentic gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God's grace. God's calling you and me to be world changers. Let's pray. Father, the people of whom the world was not worthy are primarily those in whom you, our Lord Jesus Christ, lived your risen life. We're so thankful for that, not only in history that we can read and be inspired, but also know that today that men and women around this world are doing the same thing. And we ask for your empowerment and your inspiration in our lives, that we too might be in our own way, in our own town, our own village, our own family, in our own group of friends, world changers through Jesus Christ, who loves us and empowers us. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank all of you for being with us today. And we want to invite you to Come back next week. We're going to be talking about from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 47, Loving Your Enemies. Or actually, the title is Love Your Enemies from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 47. 
Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain.